Hi, I'm Sean Willems. Welcome to the world of EdCraft. This work is a collaboration with two other colleagues, uh, Andrew Lowe, the Charles E. and Susan T. Harris Professor of Finance at MIT Sloan School of Management, and Brian Stevens, Senior Lecturer of Business Analytics and Statistics at the Haslam College of Business at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I'm Sean. Uh, I'm the Haslam Chair in Supply Chain Analytics at the Haslam College of Business, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Andrew and Brian have already posted videos uh, on their studio setups, and I encourage you to go look at those. Links are below. My six-video sequence is structured as follows. This is the first of the videos, which gives a history and design philosophy. Then I'll actually take you through a tour, sort of through all of the studio equipment so you can see things in more detail. Uh, the, then I'll share sort of learnings from the studio of design. So step two is sort of all the equipment. Step three is the learnings that, that were sort of came out of all of this. Uh, step four is what a typical class actually looks like. And, and video five is what the learnings were from teaching in the studio. Six are the content creators that I've learned from, uh, and as well as sort of parting advice uh, uh, sort of along this journey. So what I actually want to uh, accomplish sort of in this specific video, I have, I have three very specific goals. And those goals are, first, I want to provide a history of how the studio got to this point. And the studio is, is actually version three of the studio, and I want to show sort of the how the history of how it got here. I want to share the design objectives for the studio uh, as well as the course that motivated this. It's worth pointing out for a second that this is very much uh, a video sequence targeted uh, to faculty. I'm not saying that other people can't get value from, from this sequence. I certainly hope they do. But this is really very specifically targeted to faculty. And, and the reason why we say that uh, is that the sort of decisions we've made are, are geared towards teaching typically sort of uh, you know, business students uh, at, the, at the graduate and undergraduate levels. And what we want to do in these videos is give you sufficient context so that you can make design choices, but sort of with the full information of how we were thinking about the design choices we made. When we began this journey, we couldn't find any sort of single place that had put it together for faculty. And, and it's for that reason that we have created these videos. Uh, it's, it's worth pointing out, uh, I would say, sort of also that there's sort of two caveats in, in, before I really begin. The first is, I'm not an expert. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is my first studio was, went live on June 5th, 2020. I built that studio in exactly one month. And it, it was 10 hours a day, every day for, for the 30 days that, that led up to the studio. The, the process was actually so onerous and, and ended up, uh, when people saw the studio generating so many questions, that I actually built, uh, I wrote a paper on this studio. And, and that paper is here. You can actually find it uh, uh, at, at my website. And it's that draft that actually uh, had Andrew and I meet one another and sort of started us on this journey, bringing in Brian as well. So the three of us sort of began this only over the summer, of course, due to, due to uh, COVID. So, so this sort of documents this portion of the design, but it's not like I come with a wealth of experience before this. I started cold in May and, and actually began uh, this whole journey towards the studio. It's also uh, very important to point out that my studio in particular, uh, this studio exhibits marginal returns to scale. And this is an important enough point that I'd, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on it. So what, what we're here now, we're on the lightboard side of the studio. So this studio is actually has two camera stations, the talking head station that I was at earlier, and this is the lightboard station. 
sort of a very quick view of that, I had to turn off the lights, so it's something that we'll talk about having to manage for the Lightboard Studio to work. So you're actually seeing me sort of now coming from that side camera. The, this studio uh, absolutely exhibits marginal returns to scale. So what do we mean by that? Well, uh, certainly if we wanted to you know, assess the impact of a studio, a logical question would you know, be to say compare like dollars spent versus the educational potential that this studio could achieve. I'm sure faculty are immediately thinking, hey, Sean, there's other dimensions I want to think about. For example, I want like a z-axis, which is like the you know, instructor's ability or something. But, but we'll sort of put that on the side for a second and say that probably the simplest trade-off we could think of would be one that considers the dollar spent versus the educational potential of the studio, of what the studio could achieve. And I don't think it's that controversial to think that, you know, this, that this studio has marginal returns to scale. And, you know, just sort of in the simplest form, what we're saying is, you know, if we have a fixed investment of delta dollars, so if we go from, you know, sort of D1 dollars to D2, which is sort of spending of delta dollars, or we go from, you know, D3 to D4 dollars, that the the educational potential that's sort of achieved for the studio, you know, in this case, the difference between D1 and what D1 can achieve and D2 can achieve, which is pi 1, that pi 1 is greater than uh, pi 2, even though they, they are to represent the same fixed investment cost of going from the one point D1 or D3 to D2 or D4. So I think this idea that there is sort of a you know, marginal returns to the studio is, is quite straightforward. But what's interesting, I think, to think about in a studio like this is what does this actually look like? Like what does the curve look like? Is it, is it this sort of you know, smooth uh, or is it, is it potentially that you know, there's an initial jump and then, and then things sort of, sort of increase at some constant rate or is it that there is some sort of step functions, you know, you know, what does this studio actually look like? And in my belief, having done this, sort of invested in the studio and, and analyzed sort of the, the, the benefits I think it can achieve, is that it's actually a step function. That there's an initially a tremendous increase. And then after that, it, it actually takes quite a bit of investment to sort of capture each sort of marginal step function of increase which then logically leads to the question, is there an optimal investment? And I actually think there is. Uh, I actually think you can get the vast majority of the studio's benefit by spending about $600. Now, again, in fairness, this studio is a couple orders of magnitude more expensive than that. So I, I'm not trying to say that, uh, that one could get all the benefits of what this studio can do for $600, but one can get the vast majority of the benefits, and I can actually prove it because we've had other faculty create studios for $600 or less of incremental investment. You know, this is one such example of a studio that did that. Uh, this is another. So the, I think as one sort of thinking about what these studios can achieve, one can think about this in terms of, I'd say, more, more modest investments ultimately, which can achieve sort of very significant uh, educational uh, sort of teaching benefits. So if we, if we think about sort of the history of the studio, with, sort of with those two caveats sort of placed, that, you know, not an expert, but, but have thought a lot about how, how the studio can achieve sort of benefits for, for sort of incremental investment, uh, I want to give a, a very sort of quick history of the studio, because I think that will help put this in context. First, uh, you know, so version one of the studio, uh, again, this is, this is sort of a picture of version one. As you can see, we're sitting now in version three of the studio, which is, you know, this view. But version one of the studio, uh, things were more spread apart and, and uh, you know, I was still sort of learning how to put all the stuff together. Uh, you can actually see here, things are, things are a little more tidy. The, uh, this was sort of the more honest picture of the studio, 
literally the day I started teaching on June 5th when things were still on the floor, right? When it was a much, much more sort of tenuous uh, process to get everything working. It's, it's worth noting that I did have a couple uh, sort of important experiences before the first version of the studio, probably that gave me the confidence that I could actually build the studio. And, and the first was that with Steve Graves, I have uh, co-taught two sections or two courses of MIT's micro masters uh, in manufacturing. And, and those are the, the inventory analytics course and the supply chain analytics course. These courses have had uh, literally tens of thousands of, of learners. They've had hundreds if not thousands of verified learners. So we had learned a lot in, in, these, uh, in teaching this. And, and in particular, I think what we really learned was the tremendous value in using the light board which is where I was a second ago. And, and the light board, uh, what you see here, the, the light board on the right is, is the light board at, uh, at MIT's uh, ODL, which is the uh, Office of Digital Learning. And the light board on the left is actually one at the Haslam College of Business at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. So I had the good fortune to have used the light board and to sort of see what what it was capable of, uh, also to receive training from some really talented people at ODL and uh, also at technology services at, at the Haslam College of Business to, to sort of give me some comfort that I, that I could pull off the studio here. Uh, I think the other sort of main uh, sort of benefit of, of the studio experience was that when we saw it, I could also see sort of what the light board could not do. So could start to get a sense of if I wanted to develop a whole package, what would be the right way to do that? And, and in particular, version one of the studio was achieved uh, for that summer course. Version two of this studio, where some cameras were swapped out and document cameras and such, that was for a course I taught in the fall. In this version three is literally sort of just finished its design for some teaching I will be doing in the spring. So each, uh, each semester of teaching has been sort of still a continuous improvement to the studio's design. But it's, I think it's useful to give a sense of the initial purpose of the studio and how I thought about it. And in particular, uh, you know, who I was teaching to. And I was teaching uh, in the summer for version one of this studio to the Leaders for Global Operations students, to LGO. And I was teaching them the core operations management class. And that core operations management class is the classic intro operations course that say most top tier MBA programs all have. And, but there are some very unique things about the LGO program that, that are worth mentioning because they drove my design decisions. So in particular, the, the students in LGO, there are uh, each year we're talking about 50 students. This is their first uh, summer. This is their first time on campus at MIT, of course not in the summer of 2020, given COVID, but normally, right? This, this would be, uh, when we're teaching to these students, they would be on campus. They are cohorted, right? So they're sort of going through this experience together. And these students are, are very unique. These students are, uh, are quite technical. They are, they are getting a joint master's of science in, in uh, MIT's School of Engineering, as well as an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management. Almost all of the students uh, in the program started with a, you know, with a highly technical undergraduate degree. So their undergraduate degree was in science or engineering and as was their sort of first job, 
right? So they were, they were in a very technical role prior to coming to this. Why all of this matters is it's, it's fair to say that when they come into this course and they're stepping on campus, you know, at MIT for the first time, they think that things are, they think that the most important thing is the math, right? It's like they're there to learn hard stuff because they've come from an undergraduate program where they've done precisely that. And in particular, it's fair to say that in their undergraduate program, they had a world where they did, you know, 20 problems. And then, you know, on the exam, the job was to solve the 21st, right? So that's sort of a very sort of linear progression, right? There's sort of sequential problems to think about. Well, the core operations management class is entirely different than that. And, and in particular, it's, it's case-based. And what we really are showing are models that are building blocks. So we are not trying to, uh, the, the class is plenty technical, but what it is is showing how a series of small models apply. And so when we do this on campus, this tends to be pretty jarring for a set of the students. Because again, they're coming from this very technical background where they're thinking that, you know, the hard part is the math. In reality, these people are all plenty smart enough to learn the math. They don't need me to teach them the math. What they need is me to help them and help us as a group put the math in context. And I know when I've succeeded on campus, when someone eventually says like, this is too easy, and then they have the realization that it's not. So when you know, COVID threw us into a situation where this class had to be online, online synchronous, I had to think about how do we actually achieve what we achieve on campus, but now doing this through you know, this different medium and format. And so to do that, I basically had uh, three design objectives that, that this course had to achieve. So those design objectives were that the modality of the course had to match my uh, teaching style. So I like to move around. I like to, of course, show different things. I, I wanted it to be dynamic. I wanted us to be able to be like we were in the classroom, interacting with one another. And so that was my first objective. The second objective is that I wanted to make sure that we allowed students to be immersed in the moment, right? And this is, I think, so super critical in what I hope the studio design has achieved. But the goal is, you know, when we teach on campus, it's easy to immerse students in the moment. First of all, we're the center of attention. We're sort of the ring sort of leader sort of organizing this activity, right? We have students, you know, turn off their phones, close their laptop lids, right? So, so if you're there, you're engaged, you're invested, right? Of course, here in this format, it's the exact opposite, right? We're, 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 we're having them do the exact things that we have them not do on campus. Uh, the, the other sort of main design objective was to foster, but then resolve, ambiguity over the 24 class sessions. So again, just like on campus, this is a, a slow process to, to drive learning. We're not trying to get all the learning done in one 90-minute session, right? We're, we're doing this sort of a over, we're letting this sort of percolate over many uh, sessions. And, and these three objectives are, need to be internally consistent and self-reinforcing to make that happen. So what I wanted to share in today's video was this first step of the journey, in particular sort of sharing the design objectives for the studio, who it was built for, a little bit of the history of how it got here, what it can do. The sort of next subsequent videos uh, will continue this journey through the links below.